Welcome to a presentation on settler colonization and Indian slavery in 17th century Soames. I'm Dr. David Weed, coordinator of the Soames Heritage Area Project, and I'll be your host for this talk. The area around Warren, Rhode Island was once called Soames by the first people to occupy it over the past 10,000 years until the arrival of Europeans. Evidence shows that they lived very well until the outbreak of a three-year pandemic in 1616. In that pandemic, 90% of the indigenous population was killed, and those who remained alive moved inland away from the coast, leaving the Atlantic seaboard almost completely unoccupied in 1620. Still over 7,000 native people still lived inland, including over 700 Poconocets living in Psalms. European settlement of the area began with the separatists who landed at Plymouth in 1620. With the help of the Massasoit Osamequin, the group survived and began to thrive as over 2,000 Puritans arrived in Boston in the year 1630, leading to a population explosion. This has been described by authors James Axtell and Francis Jennings as an invasion. While the invasion was more by military means in the Virginia colony, in New England the takeover of native occupied land occurred in stages as the English population grew and the native population declined. The goal of the English was to colonize New England by acquiring full or partial political control over native societies and territories, founding a colony, occupying it with settlers, and exploiting it economically. Compared to other settlements on the east coast of America, this was relatively easy to do in New England because of the assistance of the Poconoca tribe. Within four months following the landing of the pilgrims, the Poconoca Massasoit Osamequin, who led all of the native population in southeastern Massachusetts, entered into a treaty with the English in March of 1621 that guaranteed military protection, and economic expansion through trade. Osamequin was especially fearful of being overrun by the Narragansett tribe, who had already moved into Poconocat land in present-day Providence and threatened further expansion into Psalms. The Thanksgiving myth, the story that every child in America has been told, serves to hide the reality of the invasion. Though indigenous people were here in 1620, they rapidly disappeared over the next 75 years through disease, war, export for slavery, and dispersal. Few English ever lamented this loss, and most celebrated the emptying of the vast frontier for economic expansion. Soames, the homeland of the Massasoit, was valued by the colonists for its open land largely unoccupied after 1620 due to disease outbreaks among the Poconocets, the English found the open cleared land bordering salt and fresh water perfect for raising their crops and grazing their livestock. Pilgrim Miles Standlish, who visited the area and brought land there, described it as the garden of the Patton and the flower of the garden. Though not a military invasion, the settlement of New England met the definition of settler colonization. Plymouth and Mass Bay were established for the ownership, propagation, and economic prosperity of the colonizers. The survival and prosperity of the indigenous people was not a goal of the English, no matter how much they benefited by them. In the process of settler colonization, land is remade into property and human relationships to land are restricted to the relationship of the owner to his property. Settlers are not immigrants. Immigrants are beholden to the indigenous laws and epistemologies of the lands they migrate to. Settlers, on the other hand, supplant indigenous laws with their own laws. In addition, settler colonization often involves the subjugation and forced labor of chattel slaves whose bodies and lives become property and who are kept landless. Slavery in settler colonial context is distinct from other forms of indenture 
whereas excess labor is extracted from persons. The slave is a desirable commodity, but unlike indenture, the person underneath is imprisonable, punishable, and murderable. For the colonists in Plymouth, cheap labor came in the form of indentured servants. Twenty of the 104 pilgrims who arrived on the Mayflower were servants. In the Plymouth court records, there's only one instance of a person being sold into slavery. In 1685, an Indian was found guilty of burglary. Instead of being fined or ordered to sit in the stocks, he was sold as a perpetual servant. Strangely enough, this is the last reference to servants and slaves in the Plymouth court records. Between the 1630s and the American Revolution, one half to two thirds of white immigrants to the 13 colonies arrived under indenture. A debt peonage system similar to indenture was also used in southern New England and Long Island to control and assimilate Native Americans from the 1600s through the American Revolution. Starting in 1642, the number of people entering indenture agreements dropped significantly. The drop in indentured agreements combined with laws concerning slavery in 1676 may indicate that colonists were thinking that slavery was a better way of providing the colony with labor. Enslavement of Indians in New England began during the Pequot War of 1636-37. The prevailing English and Indian forces in Connecticut executed male prisoners and divided the rest of the approximately 250 survivors as human spoils to be disposed absolute in the towns as household servants. According to historian Michael Guzaco, Indians could be enslaved, but unlike Africans, only for reasons that might be applied to the English themselves or the inhabitants of other recognized nations. Because colonial promoters initially emphasized the fundamental similarity between English and Indian peoples in order to promote and encourage overseas settlement and defray concerns about what might happen to English bodies in the New World, Anglo-Americans allowed the idea to develop that natives might be justifiably enslaved. Moreover, it was even imagined in some circles that there might be a purpose for Indian slavery that could be punitive, but it might also be redemptive, and it might have nothing to do with labor, or at least production. In the main, Indians continued to be viewed as a distinctive ethnologic cohort with unique rights with regard to their treatment and potential enslavement. King Philip's War presented an opportunity for personal enrichment, and the question of justifying the capture of Indians through warfare was in practice an entirely moot point. Indians were commodities, to be bought, to be sold, or in Gibbs' case, to be stolen. Presumably, he was hoping to sell them south to the Caribbean for a profit. In fact, according to Plymouth Colony records, after the King Philip War, any Plymouth colonist who captured a male Indian was required to dispose of them out of the colony by the 1st of December, next on pain of forfeiting every Indian or Indians to the use of the colony. Plymouth Colony, like Massachusetts Bay, enslaved many captive Indians. However, the colony struggled to differentiate between Indians captured in battle and those who surrendered on promise of amnesty following the war. Slavery at that time was not based on race, but on their participation in the war effort against the English. After King Philip's War, new laws required all captured males over the age of 14 to be sold as slaves outside of Plymouth Colony. Indians who had been servants to the colonists for many years were exempted from this law and were allowed to remain in the colony. However, by the end of the war, Native American servants were no longer permitted to use guns for fouling or other exercise. The general court passed a law that prohibited all male Indians who were over the age of 14 and who were captured after 1676 from remaining in the colony as servants or apprentices. Rhode Island's outright ban on slavery passed during the King Philip's War provided only the barest protections, however, since its sliding age scale permitted binding children for up to 30 years, effectively a lifetime, given death rates for Indians. Most of the other prohibitory laws regarding Indian slavery were short-lived 
unenforceable and apparently had little effect on the movement of Indian slaves and servants. The Plymouth laws against keeping Indian slaves in serv and servants did not prohibit exporting them, for example. Captured survivors, including Metacom's wife, Wooten Kansinuk, and his son Metacom, were sold into slavery in Bermuda, while others were sold as far away as the Azores and the Caribbean. Those who identified as Poconocet did not reveal their identity due to a colonial law that authorized any Poconocet over 14 years of age to be killed on sight. Writing in the book Indian Slavery in Colonial Times, author Almond Lauber suggests that the influence of Quakers in Connecticut limited official enslavement in the colony. In March of 1676, the Rhode Island Assembly even attempted to outlaw Indian slavery, but indentured servitude replaced it. Following the King Philip War, many Native Americans, especially coastal groups, could no longer practice traditional subsistence activities and therefore became increasingly dependent on European trade goods, cloth, tools, guns, alcohol, and increasingly food. Some Indians who resisted resettlement continued to live in or near English towns, worked as day laborers or servants. Such individuals occupied a precarious position, both economically and politically, however, since they lacked even the minimal protections that tribal membership afforded. Merchants trading European goods to Native Americans often inflated the cost and, based on a predatory lending scheme, advanced them credit for these purchases, knowing full well most Native Americans would not be able to repay the debts. Eventually, when debts mounted, Native Americans were hauled into court and their labor was seized to settle the debt. They were then indentured to their creditors for terms ranging from a few months to sometimes years. Meanwhile, proximity to white settlers increased the potential for charges of trespass, destruction of property by livestock, uh, contention over the ownership of resources or goods, damages, assaults, and other encounters. As a result, Indians began to appear more frequently before colonial courts immediately following the King Philip War. Women worked as household servants, children tended livestock and worked in the fields, Men did field work as well as skilled labor, entered maritime trades, and later served in the provincial forces on their master's behalf. Indian slaves and servants refused to be confined within English households and insisted on maintaining their identity and autonomy as Indians. There was a widespread English sentiment that bringing Indian women and children into orderly English households would lead to their conversion to Christianity and assimilation into English society. Indian servants in English households could sometimes rely on the safety net of a native community to which they could escape or return. By the end of the 1600s, there were probably thousands of Indian slaves. Indians often came to public auction tied neck to neck. They sold for half of what an African might bring. At times, there were so many captured Indians that a few bushels of corn or a hundred pounds of wool served as payment. Slaves bound for slave markets in Europe, Africa, the Caribbean, and elsewhere were packed tightly into ships. The money their profiteers had paid for them was used by colonial authorities to finance more wars against the Indians. Because the climate and landscape were unsuited for large-scale plantations, slavery never got planted deeply in the forested territory that the Puritans claimed and named after their mother country. The best estimates put enslaved Africans and Indians at 10% of New England's population as the 1600s ended. The economic pattern started with white settlers enslaving indigenous people captured in wars or buying from one tribe's prisoners taken into battle with another. Making slaves of natives who knew the terrain better than their masters didn't work out well. The solution was to sell them in Bermuda or Caribbean colonies in exchange for Africans so neither group of slaves would enjoy a home field advantage over their masters. As author Wendy Warren writes in New England Bound, and so it was that New England merchants and fishers and farmers provisioned the great sugar colonies and over the 17th century turned substantial profits in the process. Warren concludes, they were savvy exporters 
for it turned out that some of the fish that they sold to the West Indies was not considered worth eating in Boston. They shipped to the islands the cod rejected by both the locals and the European markets. The almost feudal relationship between Narragansett tenants and English landholders in southern Rhode Island, seen in, on Prudence Island, developed into plantation slavery after the King Philip's War. By the 18th century, Indian and African slavery were well established on southern Rhode Island's plantations, and Rhode Island had become, relative to its size, the leading holder of African slaves in New England. So by 1700, the practice of settler colonization transformed indentured servitude of native people into an exchange for African slavery in Rhode Island. By the end of the century, those Poconoke not already serving as servants to the English had largely been removed from their original homeland of Psalms. After the war, some of the Poconoke were relocated to the Chautauquet Reservation in eastern Connecticut where they continue to have their own sachem and social structure. Another group of refugees, known as the Anawan captives, fled to a rural area of Rehoboth, now Seekonk, and settled there. In time, however, those original people returned to the Rhode Island and southern Massachusetts area and now number over 300. They are now telling the story of how they were nearly disappeared by settler colonialism. Colonization is the process of exerting complete control over the indigenous people of a particular area by attempting to erase the culture, language, and histories of the land and its people. By contrast, decolonization is a process that seeks to undo the ongoing effects of colonialism, both on our physical environments, but just as importantly, on our understanding of history and culture. Until stolen land is relinquished, Critical consciousness does not translate into action that disrupts settler co colonialism. This is what the tribe is seeking to do with the Mount Hope lands that Brown University holds. Decolonization calls for individuals to use different methods to achieve this goal, such as caring for the land so as to restore sacred connections, challenging public stories such as racist or outmoded thinking about indigenous peoples, and reversing the dispossession of lands by recognizing native title. It is important and necessary for decolonization to occur in Rhode Island, specifically for the Poconocet Nation, because it seeks to restore the histories and traditions of the Poconocet that colonizers have long attempted to erase. To learn more, read Lorenzo Veracini's book, Settler Colonialism, or Eve Tuck and K. Wayne Yan's essay, Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, that you can find online at the University of Toronto Library. There is also a video of Margaret Newell speaking on the Native American slave trade at Suffolk University Law School in Boston, and her essay, The Changing Nature of Indian Slavery in New England, 1670 to 1720, is also online.